After I'd made my 2018 Christmas Lights from Poundland video, a few of you got in touch and said these strings of lights are also available in the warm white. And they are. I've now got some. Notably, the shop locally only had the 120 LED sets in the warm white. They didn't have the 50 LED sets. Maybe that's just because they've not got them in yet. Not sure. But they also mentioned that they've got a hidden feature and it's not mentioned anywhere in the box. And I had already discovered this myself. The control system doesn't just flash them on and off, it also has a timer. And that means it's got that facility that if you turn the LEDs on, presumably either in the flashing mode or the standard mode, uh, it uh, will automatically turn them off after, say, I don't know the exact time, but I think it's, it's going to turn them off after six hours and then turn them on again 18 hours later, which means that if you turn them on at, say, as I did, 10, 16 at night, one night, then theoretically it'll turn off in, say, four o'clock in the morning, but then they'd turn on again the following night at the same time. And I thought, that's quite interesting. I whipped one of the circuit boards out, and there is a position for a crystal on it, but it's not used. Now, this is interesting because I quite like these little timed power supplies because it means that it saves the battery life. The lights come on for a fixed portion of time per night, and it means that it sort of basically quadruples the battery life. And last year was the year before I experimented. I programmed a PIC microcontroller, wrote a bit of code that tries to do that, but it was using the internal RC oscillator that's built into these chips. And it, the drift was too much. It drifted with battery voltage and temperature. And it may have been a very small percentage drift, but it was the difference between uh, turning on at the correct time and turning progressively on later and later as the oscillator slowed down the battery voltage dropping. So I thought, these ones don't have a crystal, so is that going to suffer the same fate? So I turned these on at 10.16 yesterday, and they've got nickel hydride cells, which means that the voltage is around about 3.6 volts. And I monitored carefully, I kept them with me all the time to see what time they turned on, and 10.16 came, and I thought, oh, they've not turned on. And then at 10.24, which is only eight minutes later, they did turn on. So the drift is not actually that much. Eight minutes is really quite acceptable. Uh, it means that over the course of a week, it's going to gradually drift up to an hour or more, which is starting to get a wee bit significant. But at any time, if you find they're not turning on early enough, you can turn them off and on again. It'll restart the timing cycle. It's just kind of, it's a compromise to that. So let's take a look at the circuit board. The circuit board looks like this. There's not much on it, really. There is not much. I'll turn it the right way up. That would be quite nice. And this is the back of the circuit board. I've not flipped the image over this time. And also because there's not much on it, this is glossy printer paper. This is matte printer paper. You can see the difference here. It does actually look... This one has a deeper image. This one is a more lacklustre image, but some of you might like that. I don't know. Uh, so it's got the classic 8-pin chip, which I'm very suspicious as a wee cheapy microcontroller because pin 1, in this instance, is positive and pin 8 is negative. This is really common, these. And likewise, pins 2 and 3 are often used, say, in PIC microcontrollers. I think the PIC microcontroller is the same as this. They are being used for the position that would have been used for a crystal. Now, I do I have my pen here? Yes, I do have my pen here. So normally in these, and there is a position for the crystal in the back. Normally there'd be, between these two pads, there'd be a quartz crystal 32.768 kilohertz. Or 32,768 hertz, if you, if you so prefer. And likewise, there'd have been two little capacitors here. In fact, there'd have been a row of three capacitors here. One is a decoupling capacitor between the positive and negative supply rails, and the other two would have been the load capacitors for the crystal to keep it sort of loaded down and oscillating at the correct frequency. And the reason they normally use a 32.768 kilohertz crystal is that if you divide that down in binary, and I'm just, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to screw this up. Probably. Let's try this. One plus. Uh, sorry, 2 times equals 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So it's counting in binary, 512, 1024, 32,768. It's a nice round binary figure. That's why this crystal is always used in clocks, because you can use binary counters to divide it down. And it's notable that the Padauk microcontrollers... Uh, 
do have built in a facility to derive a 1 hertz time base internally from a 32.768 kilohertz crystal. They're kind of optimized for time, things like this. And that makes me wonder if this is one of these really cheap Paduk microcontrollers. So what have we got here? Well, not a lot. Ground goes to that connection, positive goes to that connection. The switch toggles between two pins in this. Now, which pins does it toggle between? Uh, I didn't check that. I think I should check that. Let's uh, bring the meter in and check. So let's uh, put this on to continuity. Let's untangle the leads, which I've turned into an unholy tangled mess. Okay. So switch is in the middle position. Let's see if we can trace where the switch leads are going to. So this one is obvious. This one is obviously going to this pin here. I wonder if the other one is going to... No, it's not. Ah, it's going to the other unused pins. So we've got the two crystals. This lead, let's draw it in. This one is going up to there. And the only other oddity in this chip, well, the other two oddities, is there's a 272, which is 27 and two zeros, 2,700 ohm resistor going to here. Why? What's that for? Is that for calibration purposes? I'm not sure. Uh, the other thing is that the... LEDs themselves, the string of LEDs are connected with one end is positive and the other end is connected to just directly to a pin. So it's just relying on the internal MOSFET uh, impedance on the little uh, transistor inside on the chip to actually limit the current to the LEDs. Another interesting and really nice feature here is that they've brought this spring in from the battery pack. It's soldered onto here. But it also has a loop that goes round, so when you screw this in with a screw, it clamps that down. If you then soldered that after clamping that down, I'm guessing that's what they do, then it's going to make sure that all the stresses are taken off the solder joint, when, or maybe they, I'm guessing they either do it in a jig beforehand, or they actually put it into the battery pack and then solder it. Uh, is there any clue in the battery pack that, that may have happened? Yes, there is. It's melted in the vicinity, so they soldered it once it was in the battery pack. Interesting. That's a clever thing that they've taken the strain off. That also anchors the circuit board in. So that's uh, all very clever features. Very nice. So what else can I say about these? They are using the microcontroller switch between flashing or static or off. Time crystal, right? Okay, that's us covered just about everything. But now... Some of you were saying, how would we convert these to run them off a USB supply instead of a battery? Well, the way you'd do that is you'd turn the power off, you'd take a pair of snips, and you'd just lop the leads off there. Let's uh, take the batteries out of this now. It's in interesting to note that the microcontroller is powered all the time from the batteries, regardless of which that's way that switches in. So it may draw a small quiescence current, but probably negligible compared to normal operational current. I'll just put this there to hold those batteries out of the way. I'm going to turn the soldier on as well, because let's convert this into a USB string of lights. Another thing that's worth noticing is uh, it's a 120 LEDs running on 50 milliamps because I emulated that I put my bench supply on instead of batteries and the current was approximately 50 milliamps through the whole lot. So it's about uh, half a milliamp each they're running at. So let's uh, improve on that and power them from a USB power supply. So I'm going to start by stripping these leads. So let's uh, strip the end off those and twist them. This is where, oh, that is super thin wire, but that's not really uncommon. Uh, it's also not twisting very well. Is this copper coated iron, I mean, I wonder? Don't know. Doesn't really matter. It's, uh, it's not a super dodgy high current thing. The most important thing here is it should be easily soldered. My solder iron is up to temperature. You may hear it buzzing in the background when I speak. Some of you recently mentioned that you heard an artifact, a noise in the background in the video. It's because, uh, and I mentioned this before, the m camera I'm recording with has a noise gate in the microphone that I haven't worked out how to disable. And what that means is that if the noise goes below a certain level, it just cuts off into perfect silence. And then as soon as you speak again, it brings the audio back. And... Uh, there was a storm outside. There is a storm again outside tonight. It's always a storm now, man, at this time of year. 
It's just the very nature of living on an island. Right, so what I like to do, I like to get a red sharpie and I'm going to get a lithium button cell. This is the easiest way to check polarity. Clamp the wires on, they've lit. If they didn't light, it's the wrong polarity, but they have lit and that means the one on the big side that's marked positive is the positive. So I'll run the sharpie in that and that is them identified as the positive lead. Okay, now we need a USB lead. Here is a typical USB lead that you might find in a typical USB power supply. You get lots of them. You know, everybody has these knocking around because they end up using their favourite USB lead. And these just end up in a pile somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this one in the middle for no good reason at all. And I'm going to nibble it and strip it. So let's uh, leave ourselves plenty of room and I'm just going to nibble it round the snips trying not to cut the wire, but by leaving a bit of slack, there is that option if I do cut the wire, it's not going to be too much of an issue. There's a pink core and a white core. It seems logical. The pink would be positive and the white would be negative, but you can never assume anything because uh, it's not that uncommon for things like this to uh, have the polarity reverse to what you might normally think. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to twist these wires and I'm going to put a little touch of solder on them. Again, they're not twisting very well. I'm seeing a common trend here of cheap wire. <clears throat> Let's uh, solder these. Make sure I'm soldering the correct side of the USB lead. Okay. So now, without letting these short, I'm going to bring the meter in again. I'm going to turn it to DC volts. And I'm going to get a random USB power supply, like this fetching pink one. I'm going to plug it in, making sure they don't short circuit. And I'm going to measure the voltage. So I'm going to put the positive lead in the pink and the negative lead on the black. And what I'm getting is... Uh, 5 volts. Uh, it, it kind of went, it was quite low there. But the main thing is uh, the I'm not getting the negative symbol. If I'd got the negative symbol, like this... Oh yeah, I'm not making a good connection here at all, am I? Or is that uh, power bank running flat? No, it's just made a bad connection. So if I'd got the negative symbol, the polarity would have been the wrong way around. But because I'm putting the red lead on the pink and the black on the white and I'm getting 5 volts uh, without the negative symbol, it means the polarity is correct. So the red is actually a positive. So I shall unplug that before I short it out. And I'm going to add some resistors in line because much as it would be nice to just basically slap this across the LEDs, that would be death to the LEDs. So I've got a couple of resistors that I've already looked out and I've chosen two 10 ohm resistors to give a total of 20 ohms. Um, so I'm going to get something to help me solder this. One moment. Uh, where is it? Helping hands. I rarely use them, but in this instance, they are quite useful. So I'm going to grip the resistor. The resistor colour code markings are brown, black, black. One, zero, zero, where one, zero, and then zero as a multiplier means that the resistor value is 10 ohms. And I'm using two because it's just kind of easy to put one in each lead and it spreads the power dissipation across them. And that's going to give a total of 20 ohms, which rather conveniently works out very well because if it's a 5 volt supply and the LEDs, the parallel circuit of LEDs, is going to be typically about 3 volts, it means there's 2 volts to drop. 2 volts divided by 20 ohms is about 100 milliamps, which is just absolutely perfect. That's actually going to be twice what the current was before. It's going to be roughly uh, 1 milliamp per LED. It doesn't matter which way around these resistors go. I'll just in this lead again and bring this lead up, put it on it and you can either put them together and uh, flow some solder in or tin the pre-tin them and then just re-flow them together like that. Perfect. Right here. Now I'm going to crop these down a bit again, the lead just to the point that enough to solder onto. And this is the important bit of remembering to put the heat shrink on. If you forget to put the heat shrink on, it's very, very annoying. 
You could kind of do it with tape afterwards. I've got a couple of bits of heat shrink. They're different lengths. I'll crop them to the same length just for cosmetic reasons. It's just basically what I had. And I'm going to slip them over the LED leads because uh, they're the longest. And I'm going to slide them right up out the way so they don't get pre-shrunk pre -shrunk accidentally. I shall also crop these leads down just a tiny little bit. Right, so let's start off with the positive. And I shall flood some soda onto that. Find the positive lead here with the red Sharpie on it. And I shall pre-tin the resistor. It just helps things flow. And I think I'll just flow some soda into this one. Again, you can... Put some solder in both and then just remelt them together. But uh, in this instance, I am just uh, flowing some solder directly onto them. And then the other resistor goes into the grips here. And I get the other lead. And let's just, for the sake of variety, just preload it with a good blob of solder. A good blob of solder in both leads so that there's plenty to flow into each other when I flow them together. I've just dripped some solder onto the connector. And then we'll just flow that, that again. And that's them soldered together. Now, theoretically, if I keep these apart, I can check things are all right before I sh heat shrink this by making sure they're not touching anything. I can plug it in and the LEDs light nice and brightly. So now I'm going to put the heat shrink over. So I'm going to slide it back down. The centre it on the resistors and then get the heat gun or you could use a lighter the heat gun has just not actually activated that's a bit disturbing have i switched that off accidentally yes i have okay so here's the heat gun and i'm just going to float that uh heat shrink and just gently melt it in. Perfect. And then get the other bit of heat shrink, slide it down over its resistor. And melt it too. And for those wondering, this breathtakingly quiet little heat gun is part of the soldering station. It's a Yahoo 8786D. A cheap and cheerful Chinese one, the only condition being that if you buy one, double check everything's correct inside earthing wise and things like that. So that's that uh, done. I'm going to take exposure off. I'm going to find that little power supply. I'm going to plug it in. And now, if I take exposure off here and turn the lights off, they're a lot brighter than before, actually. That's quite nice. They're looking slightly ferocious yellow in the video, but they're actually quite a soft pinkish white to me. Uh, and now they're being powered off a USB power supply, and, and at 100 milliamps, that is going to run those LEDs for a good length of time. So I'd say that's a good result. So the... LED lights uh, do have that timer built in, that's a useful feature to know, but you can also adapt them, both the uh, the all warm white ones or the coloured ones, to run off USB with just two 10 ohm resistors and a sawn off USB lead, so that's quite a good result.